Hi, I'm Belinda Carley, the Director of the Institute of Personal Care Science, and I'm going to talk to you about how to build a cosmetic brand and some of the startup essentials that you need to have, as well as some great tools you can use to get your brand and planning started. First of all, let's take a look at who exactly is your brand. Now, these might seem like very obvious questions, but work with me here and you'll see that there's a lot more to it than you might have first thought. And this is incredibly important because this same brand philosophy has to resonate throughout all your products, your formulas, their performance, your marketing plans, your distribution plans, every little thing you do has to resonate who your brand is. And if you look at the really successful brands out there, you'll see that it's very easy to identify what is their brand philosophy, what makes them unique, and what makes them them. So we need to start by looking at that for you and your brand and also finding a unique but opportunistic area to focus on with your brand and its products. So think about what is your brand philosophy? What's important to your brand? Start by thinking what's important to your brand, but also start to think what makes it different to other brands out there. How are your products different? Now I'm gonna ask you this question again. How are they really different? One of the things that a lot of brand owners have when they first come up with their idea or their concept or their burning desire to have a cosmetics brand is they have this idea and they do think it's different. But does it really communicate as different to other people? Will other people just get it and understand what makes your brand unique and special? And why would they want to try your products compared to everything else that is out there in the first place? So I'll ask you again, what is your brand philosophy and how are your products different, really different? So think about this. I've got some great tools for you to use in a moment to help you process this information and develop your brand and philosophy further. Think about what problems do your products solve? And then I want you to think about what benefits do your products provide? Now, if you don't have the immediate answers to all of these questions, don't worry, because we're gonna work through this in this lecture. By the end of this lecture, you're gonna have a very clear definition of your philosophy. What really does make those products different? What problems your products solve and what benefits your products provide that gives you a unique and opportunistic position in this crowded marketplace? The next thing you need to think about is, how are you going to tell this story? And how are you gonna make sure your target market hears your story? Let me give you an example. You could have the best product in the world, but if not enough of your target market hear about it or know about it, you simply won't sell enough units to survive. So, how are you going to tell this story? Is the story effective and different and will it be heard by your target market? How can you achieve all of these things? We're gonna go through this in coming lectures, but the focus of this lecture first is to get a really clear, definitive picture of who is your brand, what makes it different, what problems your products solve, and what benefits they provide. So in your activity workbook that comes with these lectures, I've got this first activity for you. Let me just take you to Dropbox so I can show you what else you get with this workshop series. We've got all of the PowerPoint lectures for you here. We have a detailed study checklist, and this study checklist tells you what to watch and what activities to complete in the correct order to get the best learning out of the workshops. We've also got this fantastic Cosmetic Brand Essentials Workbook where you will find all of the tables and activities that I direct you to over this and coming lectures so that you can build your own brand detail and really get a clear direction for your brand and products that you're going to create. There's also a load of pricing tables, project timelines, regulatory essentials, all in this one workbook. And you can find them all in the Dropbox link provided with your welcome email when you sign up for this workshop series. You also get all of the PowerPoints in detail, so you can read and refer back to this information whenever you need it. So now let's take a look at this first activity from your workshop booklet. So please start by writing what is your brand philosophy? What makes your products unique and different? 
what problems do your products solve and what benefits do your products provide? Now if you're sitting there at this point and I've already made you start to question what is really different, don't worry about that just yet. Let's just do some brainstorming and write down some of the key information about what your passions and desires are for your brand. What is that philosophy? What does make the products different at this point in time? Don't worry, we'll work on this more. What problems do your products solve and what benefits do your products provide? So start by filling this part of the table out. I also want you to describe your target market, their age, their gender, their nationality, family status, work and educational status, income and hobbies. Who is your target market? Now when we're talking about a target market, you should be relatively specific. The age range should be within a five to 10 year age band. The gender may or may not be specific. You might be creating unisex products, but put that down if that's what you are. Or is it for men or is it for women? The nationality is important because this impacts some of the formulation aspects to suit different skin types or hair types. Their family status, are they married? Do they have children? Are they single? Are they party goers? All of this is really important to make sure that your product is attractive to a very specific target market. Their work and educational status, any hobbies and their income. The income becomes important when you look at your pricing strategies, which we're gonna cover in a coming lecture. But write this information down first. Make sure it's pretty specific. Remember, you will attract people from outside of this specific target market range. So when you're defining your target market, don't be afraid of missing out on people because that's not necessarily the case. It just means that your product is going to suit a very specific type of person. And that way you can make sure the product, its marketing, its distribution is as attractive as possible for a specific type of person within a relatively tight age range. That way you'll get the most attention from the people most likely to purchase your product. You'll always get the outliers, people above or below the age range, people of different genders, people of different nationalities. But by making your target market quite specific, it gives you a good idea of who you're trying to aim for in the first place. I want you to write down where you plan to sell your products. Now, all of these plans could change from coming lectures, but I really want you to get your ideas down on paper first so you can start with some clear examples of where you think your brand's headed. This is an activity workbook for a reason, so that you can refine it and shape it just as you need to be ready for successful brand management in the future. We've got to start somewhere. I want you to write down the key claims you are planning to make about your products, about specific products, about your product range as a whole. Please put some claims you wanna make here. We are going to take a look at claims and regulatory compliance very soon because this is very, very important to refine from the start. But what we wanna do right now is we wanna see what these key claims are and see how much polishing we have to do. How are you planning to promote your products? List all sources and I want you to rank them in importance for you and your brand and your target market, starting at one. What is the primary marketing tool you're going to be using at this stage? Again, when we look at budgets and media planning, this could change, but right now we need a plan to start from. So write those points down here as well. Now let's take a look at some regulatory issues. Now we are going to expand a lot on labels, claims and evidence in lecture two. But right now we wanna make sure that your initial ideas fit the definition of a cosmetic and is a story you can tell proudly and loudly. When I see a lot of people with their product concepts and ideas at the early stages, they just don't understand what is or is not a cosmetic. So they might be planning to go out in the marketplace with products that don't fit the definition of a cosmetic, with branding, with imagery, with performance, with ingredients that again, don't fit the definition of a cosmetic. And you're not gonna be able to get that product out in the marketplace long before you're pulled up by the regulators or legal requirements. So let's look at the products you wanna create and make sure you're starting off on the right foot. The definition of a cosmetic does differ around the world, but it's broadly defined as products for external application to alter the appearance or odors of the skin. It is not meant to have a physiological or cellular function 
so you can't be making claims or suggesting that it does. Cosmeceuticals sit at the interface between cosmetics and therapeutic or medicinal products. So every claim made about a cosmeceutical needs to be appearance based. For example, if you are creating a skin whitening product, it needs to be about visibly lightening the appearance of the skin. You can't talk about the cellular mechanisms of how those active ingredients work. Now, while you can have those discussions with the chemist, or if you are the chemist formulating the products, you can definitely work on the cosmeceutical functionality of the product. This can't be marketed, communicated, or told to the consumer in any way. So, how is your product different? If you're going to bring out yet another whitening product, how are you going to tell your story differently to everyone else? You can't talk about the physiological mechanism of the skin lightening. You can only talk about the visible changes that that product can create. And of course, the ingredients used must also be cosmetic ingredients under regulations specific to the country you're selling the product in. Now, sometimes people, when they're starting out, think, well, that's okay, I'll just link to another website or somewhere else where it talks about how the ingredients work. Well, you can't do that either. Any activity that you do, whether it leads to sale or not, is considered a promotion. So for example, you can't have testimonials on your website that talk about physiological aspects of the product. You can't have testimonials on your website that say how your product has increased hair growth or cured their eczema or psoriasis because these are all not suitable claims for a cosmetic product. Even though they're testimonials, even if they're genuine, even if you link to another website where those testimonials are placed, it's still considered advertising of your product and your brand can't do that. So again, how are you going to tell the story? How is your story different to everyone else out there when you realize that now you can't be doing that kind of advertising? You can't make physiological claims in any way. So we can't talk about how antioxidants will quench free radicals. We know that antioxidants will quench free radicals. That's exactly what they do. But your marketing can't say that. You can say your product contains an antioxidant if it does in fact contain an antioxidant but you can't be saying what is happening on a physiological level. I hope this is making sense because this is really important for you at this very early stage. Even though you may have already listed the key claims you are planning to make, we're gonna work on them. We're gonna work on them in a good way so that you have a strong but compliant story to tell, which is why I'm talking about some of these issues at this very early stage, because I deal with a lot of people starting up a brand, and these are some of the things they just don't realize. Sometimes they go out in the marketplace and they don't realize until it's too late, and they have to recall their product, relabel it, and remove it from the marketplace. Now that's a very expensive mistake to make, and I don't want that to happen to you which is why I'm explaining it to you at this early stage. So as a summary, you can't imply a physiological effect from your product in any way. You can't link to websites or pages with therapeutic claims. And again, we know that some herbal extracts and essential oils have been used traditionally for medicinal purposes to fix certain skin conditions. But you can't suggest that your product, your cosmetic, can do that. You can't even link to external websites where someone can find that information for themselves. Because remember the definition of an advertisement is any way of promoting your product, whether it leads to a sale or not. So if you're linking to a website where that information is, you are attempting to lead to a sale, whether it leads to a sale or not. It's considered advertising and your brand can get in trouble for it. You'll need to at the very least remove the link and if it's on your labels you'd need to recall your product relabel your product before you can put it back out there so it's a very serious offense if you get caught and a lot of times when small brands start they think well i'll just start no one's going to notice me and while you're small you might get away with it but it doesn't make it right and this is what some other small competitors that you might be competing against may be doing but it will eventually catch up with them because it's not compliant anywhere in the world to advertise or promote your products using any of these tactics. You cannot imply harm from approved cosmetic ingredients and we're gonna take a look at this in this lecture and a coming lecture because the EU has put out their technical guidance on free from claims so that you can't imply harm from any approved cosmetic ingredients. 
and you can't make claims you don't hold evidence for. Even the input of natural, even calling your product natural or organic, if it is in fact not certified natural or organic, or does not have a very high natural or organic content. It's all about truth in marketing, and you need to make sure you comply with that from the very start, even if someone else is already saying or doing the wrong thing. So you can see here the key claims you are planning to make may not all be suitable, but that's okay because we're gonna work on these to give you some strong but compliant claims, and that is a strong starting point for your brand. So now let's take a look at whether your product is actually a cosmetic. And one of the main things I wanna show you is sunscreens. Sunscreens are regulated so differently around the world. We are focusing on cosmetic brand management here. So you can't have anything other than a cosmetic if you're going to be marketing it in certain areas of the world. So for example, in Canada and USA especially, Sunscreens, any SPF claim, it's considered a drug and it needs to be treated completely differently to cosmetic products. We won't be talking about drugs in this lecture series, so we're gonna be focusing on cosmetics. The underlying message here is if you're marketing a product for the USA or Canada, it can't have an SPF claim on it at all in the cosmetic realm. You can see there's some conditions of when SPF is or is not okay in Australia. And then if you take a look at antibacterial, anti-acne, anti-dandruff, antiperspirant, and hair dryers, you can see they also have different treatments in different places around the world. So let's take a look at the products you are planning to have. Is it a cosmetic in the regions you plan to sell it? You might need to refine your plan a little based on this table. And again, this guidance is given to you so that you don't make mistakes in the early stages, but you can instead plan for success by making good choices from the start. Okay, let's look at some examples to make sure that this is making sense to you and you can think about how different products are regulated around the world, and especially if the products you are planning to create fall in one of these categories. Now I'm going to run through the questions in this table and I'd like you to complete this activity and then pause the lecture and then I'm going to give you the answers. But please pause the lecture before I give you the answers because I really want you to think about how these different products might be considered around the world so that we can make sure you're understanding the concepts of whether your product may or may not be a cosmetic in your particular region. First of all, a hair serum claiming to restore hair growth. Is this considered a cosmetic? If so, which countries? Or if not, which countries? An aloe vera after sun gel with no SPF claim. Would this be considered a cosmetic? And if so, in which countries? A healing calendula balm. If this is the marketing statement and it's containing an extract, would it be considered a cosmetic? A moisturizer to visibly brighten the skin. Would this be considered a cosmetic? And if so, in which regions? An anti-acne foaming cleanser. How would this be considered in different parts of the world? An anti-fungal cream. Would this meet the definition of a cosmetic? And tinted moisturizer with SPF 20. So a colored product, just a tint of color in a moisturizer with an SPF 20. How would this be considered in different regions around the world? Now I want you to pause the lecture while you think about how these products might be considered, especially in your part of the world that you're watching this lecture. Now I'm ready to give you the answers. So a hair serum would not be a cosmetic anywhere in the world when it's claiming to restore hair growth. Restoring hair growth is not a cosmetic function. So it would be considered beyond a cosmetic in all parts of the world. An aloe vera after sun gel with no SPF claim would be suitable in every country around the world if its claims are also compliant. In this case, it's just saying it's an after sun gel with aloe vera, and that's perfectly acceptable as a cosmetic in all regions of the world. A healing calendula balm would not be considered a cosmetic in any parts of the world. The term healing implies a therapeutic or physiological effect, and that's not suitable for a cosmetic. So that would be a no in all of these regions. 
A moisturiser claiming to visibly brighten the skin would be considered cosmetic in all of these regions. It's talking about visible changes, it's a moisturiser, and these are both perfectly acceptable as cosmetics. And as long as the claims are about brightening the appearance of the skin, it would be considered cosmetic in all regions. An anti-acne foaming cleanser is perfectly acceptable to market as a cosmetic product in Australia and Europe and Asian region because they follow Europe conventions, but would not be acceptable as a cosmetic in the USA or Japan. An antifungal cream is not considered a cosmetic anywhere in the world. It's talking about fungus and that is considered to be more of a therapeutic or diagnosable condition. So that would not be an acceptable cosmetic claim anywhere. And a tinted moisturiser with SPF 20 would be considered a colour cosmetic and would be okay in Australia, Europe, ASEAN countries, again because they follow European conventions, and Japan. But that SPF 20 claim is a real problem in the USA, so it would not be considered a cosmetic in the USA. How'd you go? How many of those did you get right? Hopefully you're seeing how different products get treated in different regions of the world and that can help you decide is your current idea a cosmetic or is it more? Or how could you alter it so that it does comply with being a cosmetic? So now let's talk about free from claims. It seems you can't turn your head sideways in the personal care industry without hearing that a product is free from and some extensive list, typically free from parabens, PEGs, sulfates, propylene glycol, etc. Now there's nothing wrong with these ingredients when they're used in the appropriate way in cosmetic formulas. But because it's gotten so out of hand, the regulators have come up with an EU technical guidance document which helps guide people into deciding whether they are being misleading and deceptive with their free from claims or whether it's actually helping a consumer make an informed purchasing decision. The underlying basis for these EU technical guidelines is that there is nothing wrong with parabens when they're used within their regulatory limits. There is nothing wrong with sulfates when they're combined and formulated in an appropriate manner. And there's nothing wrong with pegs because we don't have impurities present in those materials that cause health problems. So we can't suggest that a product is better by not having these perfectly acceptable cosmetic ingredients because it implies there's something wrong with those ingredients and a consumer should be scared of them. And that is misleading and deceptive conduct. We can't be untruthful in our advertising, so we can't be saying a product is free from certain substances when there is no technical basis behind it. Just briefly, because we are going to focus on this more in lecture two when we look at labels, claims and evidence, you can't say that a product is free from substances that aren't permitted in cosmetics anyway. So for instance, you can't say that your cosmetic is free from corticosteroids because corticosteroids aren't allowed in cosmetic products anyway. You can't say that a product is free from substances that may be formed. For example, you might have a formaldehyde forming preservative. That might be how it works. But when used within regulatory limits, it's demonstrated to be perfectly safe for consumers. But it's still not correct to suggest that your product is free from formaldehyde if there is an ingredient that functions by forming formaldehyde for its efficacy. And again, the amount that it creates is only enough to kill off microorganisms. It is not enough to harm a consumer. You can't say that your product is free from fragrances if it does in fact contain an aromatic substance like an essential oil or fragrance. You can't say that a product is free from something that wouldn't normally be present anyway. So for example, balms and lipsticks don't contain water and don't need preservatives. So therefore it's misleading to suggest that that product is better than others by saying it's free from preservatives because lipstick and balms don't contain preservatives anyway. So you can't be making a misleading claim like that that suggests that your product is better than others when it's a feature that your product would never have in the first place. You can't say that a product is free from allergens and sensitizers mm -hmm. because someone somewhere may react. You can't say that a product is free from parabens or sulfates or pegs because there's nothing wrong with these ingredients in the first place. It's totally marketing gone mad. So you can't be suggesting that your product is better than a competitor's product simply because you don't contain these ingredients because there's nothing wrong with these ingredients in the first place. It's not giving a consumer a proper informed choice. It's instead marketing on fear. 
You can't say that your product is free from preservatives if there is in fact an ingredient providing a preservative function. For example, there's some preservatives out there that also have skin conditioning benefits. But if they were removed from the formula, microorganisms would grow. So unless you hold evidence to show that your formula would not grow microorganisms without that ingredient, then you can't suggest it's not acting as a preservative if it is, in fact, doing that function. You can say that your product is free from animal products or suitable for vegans or suitable for halal if, in fact, it is. This is giving a consumer an informed purchasing decision. It's not marketing on fear. It's not marketing about ingredients that a product wouldn't contain anyway. It is truthful and giving them a truthful option. As I mentioned, we're gonna take a look at these in more detail in the next lecture. But if this has been part of your intended marketing claims, you'll need to rethink your strategy. So now you might be saying, but I'm in the US, how much of this applies to me? Well, it doesn't apply to you directly, but it's still misleading and deceptive to your consumer. And it will eventually impact your market. For example, this EU technical guidelines document is recognized in Europe by their courts. And those courts can use this technical guideline document to make a decision about whether a company has been misleading to a consumer in their promotions and advertising. And if you're saying any of these things with red X's next to them, it's misleading. And if it's considered misleading in Europe, it's gonna be considered misleading in the USA. That doesn't just apply to USA, it applies to everywhere in the world, but it is now part of EU legislation to be able to use this technical guidelines document. And it will come across to the rest of the world in time. So if you're marketing your product based on these types of claims, I'm going to suggest that you get a better and stronger marketing message that focuses on the benefits of your product and the problems your product solve. And if you remember, that's one of the things we had in this first table here. It's focusing on the positives of your product rather than these false negatives which won't be able to be advertised in the near future anyway. So now let's run through that first table that you're working on. What is your brand philosophy? How have you had to change it? How have you been thinking that maybe you're not that different from everyone else at this point in time? But where is some opportunity? We're gonna take a look at how you find that in a moment. What makes your products unique and different? Hopefully you're starting to see where you might need to refine this message too, to have a really strong and unique point of difference, different to what else is being done. And if you don't have that idea quite yet, don't worry, we're gonna have a look at another tool you can use to help refine this concept in a moment. What problems do your products solve? Hopefully now you're focusing a lot more on the product and its features and benefits and what it can do for your target market. This is gonna be where you pull some really strong marketing claims from. What benefits do your products provide? Again, the features and benefits, focusing on the positive that your product can bring to the market. And key claims you're planning to make. You may have had to refine these a little. You may have found that what you thought was your cosmetic product can't be a cosmetic, but hopefully you've got some ideas of how it could be a compliant cosmetic product. And hopefully too, you're thinking about some of the features and benefits you can market about that product and list those here. Remember, this isn't a document set in stone. It's something we're gonna work with to help give you a really strong position moving forward. And that is how you have a successful brand in the marketplace. Here are some essential elements. If you don't already have these in your product story and philosophy, you'll need to include them. You need a sustainability message. You simply cannot have a brand and be successful in this industry without some sort of sustainability message. Does your packaging reflect this? Minimize your packaging, okay? So if you've got a product that you were gonna put in a box, in another box or part of a kit, could you reduce some of the packaging you're intending to use? Consumers are turning away from excessive packaging, so make it part of your brand strategy and to also resonate with your sustainability message to remove any extra packaging you don't need. Now, if you're shipping internationally, you're going to need some packaging to protect your product. But think about it. Look at that packaging you were planning to use and think, is it really necessary? And while packaging might be attractive, 
your consumer is also more interested in the product story and how that product performs. That's where your investment needs to go, not just fancy packaging if that's driving one of your costs. Minimize that packaging and also look at the costs. Keep that low so that you can put the money into the product and the marketing so you can be found, heard and purchased. Do your material choices also reflect your sustainability message? So your sustainability message could be about carbon footprint, it could be about recycling, it could be about using materials that are otherwise cast off as waste like coffee beans. It could be about giving back to remote communities. You need to have a sustainability message as part of your brand. So think what suits your company best. Could it be in the raw material sourcing, a low carbon footprint or sustainable sourcing in that way? Do all of your ingredient choices reflect this message? Are you giving back to remote communities? Is that message being portrayed? And remember, you can update your table with some of this information too. Make sure you include some natural materials in your product, but this doesn't mean it has to be all natural. Okay, products are still very successful when they just contain a couple of natural materials. Consumers resonate with a natural message, but it doesn't mean your product has to be natural, but your product is gonna benefit by having some element of natural in it. It may only be one or two ingredients, could be your choice of actives, could be that you're putting in some natural oils to provide their extra uh, nutritional benefits from those plant oils. It could be something like that. It could be the majority of your message but you do need something natural in there. This is something we're seeing that brands need to have some element of natural to resonate with consumers. There is a US bill on natural now that requires that products must contain a minimum of 70% natural ingredients, excluding water. So after you take the water out of the formula, 70% of what's left still has to be natural. So it's a relatively high input before you can market the product as natural or use natural in the name. So just be aware of that. But again, we are gonna look at claims and evidence in the next lecture, including a discussion on natural. And of course, certifiers have strict requirements to call your product natural or to certify it as natural or organic. Now that might be important for your brand, it might not. And when I'm talking about making sure your product has some natural element or ingredient to it, it doesn't mean that you can then market the product as all natural or imply that it's all natural. What I'm saying here is even if you have a product that you weren't going to include some natural ingredients because they're not necessary, consumers do resonate with some natural input. So find a place for natural in your product, whether it's all natural, a little natural, or really just a couple of natural components to resonate with your consumers. Just make sure that your message doesn't overemphasize how natural it is, if it is in fact not. You do need certain key hero ingredients to compete against your brand leaders and your competitors, but you need to have a strong point of difference. How do we find this out? Let's take a look at how we research your competition. And this is also going to help you build a good brand philosophy and your brand messages. So when you're researching your competitors, you should be looking at your brand leader. How do you know they're a brand leader? You'll see them, you'll see them everywhere. They have a big advertising spend. They'll be in magazines, on billboards, public transport. You'll just know who your brand leaders are because they're simply there. And you're looking for the brand leaders in your space. So if you're working with anti-aging women's creams, then you'd be looking for the brand leaders in that area. If you're dealing with men's fragrances, you'd be looking for the brand leader in that area. And you only need to open a few magazines, jump on a bus, or wait for a train and you'll soon know who your brand leaders are. Turn on TV, have a look at Facebook, you're gonna see who the brand leaders are because they're just everywhere. They're featured in editorials of magazines, they have key positioning in stores, they're positioned, they've got posters, their displays, and they're compared to and talked about in social media. They're your brand leaders. So when you're researching your competitors, you need to look at one brand leader. Now the brand leader could be completely different price frame to your products and what you intend to have. But your brand leader is a brand leader for a reason and it's because their product and story works. So we do need to look at the brand leader even if their pricing strategy and their marketing is nothing like what you plan to do. The way that they're marketing the product, the imagery, the product itself, 
it's a brand leader for a reason. So we need to look at what's so successful about their product, even if you're in a completely different pricing strategy. You can then look at your key competitors. Now your key competitors will help you figure out how your product needs to be similar in the way it performs and any hero ingredients you simply must have, but also help you see what you might need to do to be different. Your key competitors will have a similar product, will be aiming for a similar target market in terms of age, income, their pricing strategy is very, very important. And you'll also see where your key competitors are marketing their products. Now, these are the ones that you are competing directly against. And it gives you a really good idea of how you need to market your product as different, similar enough that you're then competing in this space, but clearly different enough that might attract some of those consumers to purchase your product instead and your pricing strategy. It will give you a really good idea on your pricing strategy and some of your marketing strategies as well. Not a key competitor are products with a very different price point. So your brand leader may not be a key competitor, but it will give you an idea about what's so important in that type of product to be successful. If the product's aimed at an entirely different target market, they're not a key competitor. And this very much revolves around the price as well. So if the pricing isn't where you plan to put your product, it's not a key competitor. It could be a brand leader, but it is not a key competitor if the pricing is entirely different to where you plan to position your product. Even if the product is the same or similar to what you're offering, if the price point in that target market doesn't match yours, they're not a key competitor. So what can you do at your early stages? Well, this is what this entire lecture is all about. It's about helping you plan your brand strategy from the start before you get too far into it and definitely before you invest too much money into what may not be a totally workable idea. Let's rework it until it is. So we have looked at, is it really a cosmetic? We've had a look at some of the key claims you shouldn't be focusing on and instead the features and benefits that you should be focusing on. Now we're gonna take a look at this competitor and brand leader concept so that you can really make sure your product is truly unique with a strong point of difference that can be marketed well. So with your desk research, you can do it easily from any computer and that's why it's called desk research. You need to look at the brand leader for that product type. They may be a different price, but they've obviously done something right to become a brand leader. So you need to identify what that is and what can you capture and put into your product, even if it's a completely different price point. And then you should be looking at two key competitors for your target market. Now this is another activity we've got in the brand workshop booklet for you to work through. And we'll take a look at this in just a moment. Now we want you to be very product specific. Look at the key claims, the point of difference that they're promoting. What stands out as their key marketing message? You need to make sure yours is different, but if you find that a lot of the brand leader and competitors use certain ingredients, like vitamin A for example, you might need to include a small amount of vitamin A, otherwise you won't be considered as competitive as their products, but you still need a strong point of difference. How do we find this out? The desk research and being specific about hero ingredients, key claims, the size and the packaging type and the pricing that they offer. It will give you a really clear definition of what size your product should be, what sort of packaging it should be in, what key ingredients your products must contain to be considered competitive or acceptable, or what ingredients you need to be different. And also looking at where they sell. Now this could also be your point of difference. Mind you, even the big brands sell online these days. So if online was one of your key strategies, we just need to make sure you're super effective about it. So let's take a look at this table. And as I mentioned, this is in your brand workshop when you purchase the workshop series with us. So for your brand leader, I want you to write down the product name, the size and packaging, the price, distribution, key ingredients, key claims and marketing sources. And then do this with two key competitors. Remember your brand leader may be in a different space because of their price point and definitely because of their marketing strategies.
but then you look at your key competitors who would be at your price point and would be using some similar marketing strategies that you would have access to as well. So now I've done an example for you so you can see how we would conduct this research. Let's say I wanted to bring out a women's night cream and I want this to be say for a 45 to 55 age target market and I want to investigate what are my brand leaders doing and what are my key competitors doing so that I can find out what size I should make my product, what sort of pricing I could have my product as, what some of the key marketing strategies or hero ingredients that my competitors are using. So I want you to take a look here and have a look at the example that I've provided about how I would go about conducting that research because this is so important when you're forming what you're going to do with your brand. So for example, I found this particular brand leader and again, they're everywhere. They're in magazines, they're on billboards, they're in airports, they're everywhere. Um, they have their rejuvenating overnight cream. It's a 50 ml jar. It's 140 Australian dollars for that 50 ml jar. They sell online, prestige pharmacies, spas, department stores, the key ingredients. So they talk about natural ingredients here and also this high-end sounding Biosome 5. It's got an interesting name and an interesting story to tell. The key claims are based on these key actives as well as it having uh, improvements to elasticity and firmness. So a firm claim about what it's doing for the skin, the features and benefits for the, for the actual skin uh, and the story is about the actives that are selected that are doing this activity. And marketing sources, department store brochures, leading women's magazines. So that's obviously a brand leader. Um, their pricing is much higher than I might ever intend to sell my product. So the pricing is not so relevant, but the size of the packaging and the way that they're marketing their message and the way they're focusing on these natural ingredients as their key hero ingredients, the name of the product, this is still important information. So if I look at one competitor, and again, make sure you look at at least two competitors in your target market. Let's say now I was looking at Cora Organics Rejuvenating Day Night Cream. Already I can see something very important about these types of product. The word rejuvenation is used in both. So this could be important for me. I might need to include this type of word or similar wording so that I can be competing in that space. They have a 50 mil tube. So 50 mil seems to be the important size for this marker. Their pricing is $59.95 AUD. Let's say that gives me good information about what I should price my product as because I can't be as expensive as a known brand. I need to come out a little cheaper so that I can be a little more enticing to convert a purchasing behavior from a product they're already purchasing and see value in to mine which might be a little cheaper, but still have a strong message. Now, part of the battle that you need to win when introducing your brand into the marketplace is to win over the purchase. Consumers are already buying something. You need to convert that purchasing behavior to your product. How can you do that? You need multiple exposures, and we're gonna talk about cost-effective ways that you can achieve that in a later lecture. But you also need to make sure your pricing strategy is a little below what they're already paying so that they want to try your brand. Or it could be some other strategies you might use, like some special offers, promotional packs, or buy one, get a trial offer as well. This we'll look at in a later lecture. But you've got to have something appealing to actually get them to convert from what they're currently buying to your product. Until you've won that battle, you haven't won the purchase. And again, we're gonna look at some of those marketing strategies in a later lecture, but part of that is making sure it's priced right and it's in the right size for the type of product they're expecting. Distribution of this product is online, prestige pharmacies and department stores. Key ingredients, they're again focusing on their ingredients, some vitamins and some other extracts. So they've got a lot of extracts in their product with some vitamins as well. Key claims is that it controls excess oil and provides antioxidant protection. And marketing sources, pharmacy and department store brochures and leading women's magazines. Now for my target market, they're gonna be more interested in this elasticity and firmness type of claim than antioxidant protection and oil control. That's definitely gonna suit more of a younger market. So while this gives me good information about a rejuvenating night cream, it also helps me focus on how I can compete with this competitor in this pricing strategy to focus on something they don't have. 
I can see that I need to make sure my product contains some natural elements and extracts to be competitive. So how do we summarize this? First of all, we need to think, is there still a good opportunity? And I've just identified where my opportunity is to have a product that has this nice natural story with all these extracts and vitamins, but has a stronger emphasis on the anti-aging message for my target market. I can already see where my product should be priced. And I can see that online is utilized by my competitors, but it might be the best source that I have to distribute my product when I'm starting out for my budget. And that's usually the way a lot of startup brands start out utilizing their online presence. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just gotta make sure it's really effective. So you get repeat exposures so people start to notice your brand, as well as that good story, which we're working on right now. Is there a different story to tell? This is why you need to look at at least two competitors, because you need to make sure that you've got a strong and different story to tell. If I was to just talk about the extracts and plants in my product, it wouldn't be a strong story. But if I talk about these plants and extracts and how they can help improve elasticity and firmness, it is a strong story against this particular competitor around this particular price point. I hope you can see how we're finding that point of difference that gives me a strong marketing position against this direct competitor. And I'm using the concepts that have worked well for the brand leader. That's why we look at the brand leader as well. So I can now fill out this table here. Now what happens if you look at your brand leader and a couple of your competitors and you find that the stories are all just so similar? Where's the point of difference there? If the marketplace is too crowded, you might need to rethink your product. You might need to rethink it a little, you might need to rethink it a lot. But at least at this very early stage of desk research, before you've invested money into development, now is the time to make your plans change if they need to. And that's part of what we're discovering by doing this initial research. It's very important that if you do discover your marketplace is too crowded, that you discover it now and you figure out how you can change your product to have its own unique position before you go too far into the investment into the development of future products. So let's look at my findings. And if you were to do some findings on uh, rejuvenating night creams for women in the 45 to 55 year age range, you would find it is a crowded marketplace, but it is such a big market that there's still opportunity. But I need to define that target market well, and I need to provide a good offering at competitive price and make sure I prepare some multiple exposures, which is part of your media planning and strategy, which we'll go through in a later lecture. So what can I find out for my product? I would need to have rejuvenating or similar in the product name. Having day and night cream would make it quite a marketable product. A 50 ml is important. And I might pick a jar, I might pick a tube, but 50 ml was definitely important. My pricing strategy is below my direct competitor, well below the brand leader, but below my direct competitor. And this is how I start to plan my pricing strategy. My distribution, definitely online, and possibly build to have pharmacy, department store, salon exposure. These are options, and when you're first starting out, you wanna keep those options open. Where would you like your product to be distributed to if you could? So write them down now, because that's part of your planning. Key ingredients, what I can see is I need a clinically proven plant active to make my story about that active. I need at least one extra plant extract or oil and a vitamin. I could see that from my competitors to have a strong position. I need to have some of what they've got and then something unique as well. And that's what I've identified here. Key claims should be about the key natural active. Again, that was very important in my desk research about skin renewal and rejuvenation. So it can resonate with the product name. Antioxidant would be great, Firmness and elasticity is very, very important for the target market I've identified. And my marketing sources, definitely utilizing online and social media, but then also thinking about if I get placement in pharmacy or department stores, I'm going to need to advertise in their brochures as well. So I can write that down. This gives me clear directions for my product. So who is your brand now? How has your brand philosophy had to change from some of this market research?
What makes your products unique and different? Now already from my directions I can see my products are unique and different because they'll have a plant-based active ingredient. Now other competitors have this too but that's I need to find a unique plant active to tell my unique story. What problems do my products solve? Well it'll be very much focused on their anti-aging category skin firmness, elasticity, skin rejuvenation and that will resonate across all my products. What benefits do your products provide? So think about that as well. And again, it could be about anti-aging performance of the product at a competitive price. I can describe my target market here. I can see there's opportunity and I can describe them here by age, gender, income, educational status, where they normally shop. I can also see from competitors where they might normally be exposed to products. And I can fill that out here, how I'm planning to promote the products. So online is one thing. But your website's not going to be found if you don't get people there through other sources. So social media could be one of my top ranking promotional avenues. And I might also find brochures or other ways of promoting the product, which we're going to discuss in detail in later lectures. The key claims I'm planning to make, I'm planning to make the claims a lot about skin firmness, elasticity, uh, skin renewal, rejuvenation, about natural actives and about having some vitamins and other plant extracts. So already you can see I've reshaped my brand where I can see that there is opportunity in that space. And of course, if you're sitting there thinking, well, my product's completely different and my desk research really didn't find me a very big point of difference, then your marketplace is too crowded. Change your product now. It's the time to do it. And then rerun all of these activities and exercises to make sure that your product has some real opportunity. So we've now identified a strong and unique brand identity and how you can find it. A price point, size and packaging type that your product should be in. The required hero ingredients or hero story, but some strong points of difference as well. Some suitable claims with a strong point of difference and whether your product really is or is not cosmetic to begin with and how you might need to alter it so that it is. The definite opportunity that is there for you or reshape your idea until there is definite opportunity. You've also looked at where you're going to sell and we're looking at an online presence as our initial offering but we do want to consider department stores and pharmacies later and where to promote the products and again that online presence and social media is so important initially but we have other opportunities or we're going to build in budgets to advertise in department store brochures if we're accepted into department stores later. So we've got a really good plan and we've identified the opportunity and the type of key ingredients that we need to have in our product, key claims, key messages that give us opportunity in this marketplace. We have effectively done a proof of concept. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it doesn't take long for you to do your desk research and reshape your ideas to get really clear ideas of where your brand needs to go, who the brand is, what your philosophy is, and how you're going to take it forward. Now you're ready for the next stage. So incoming lectures, what are we going to talk about? Well, the very next lecture, we're going to look at label claims and evidence and how to get your ingredient list right. We're going to look at testing in the third lecture. What safety, stability, and performance testing do you need? And what should it cost? Let's talk about that in the early stages so you can start budgeting for the essential elements that your brand needs. We're going to look at legals in lecture four. We're going to talk about intellectual property rights, insurance, patents, trademarks, confidentiality, manufacturing, who owns the formula, and what happens if things go wrong. We're then going to take a look at pricing and timelines, how to price your product right, how much should it cost, how much should it cost for you to develop your brand and get it out there in the first place. We're going to also take a look at how you manage your product, all the moving parts and how long it should take. We're also going to take a look at how you plan your marketing, your social media and marketing strategies as well as your distribution. This is a very important conversation to have once we've framed everything else about your product. And of course, then we're going to take a look at how can you attract investors or how can you get into those pharmacy and department store lines and that's to have a really strong business plan. So we're going to take a look at your business plan in lecture seven. 
I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you haven't already joined up with our workshops, you can sign up for them online and watch the rest of the lectures, as well as get our very handy brand building workshop tools, some of these tables and charts, and there's a lot more to come to help you build your cosmetics brand from the start. Happy branding.